morning, everyone. Morning. And welcome to our worship here in Eglis this Sunday. It's good to see you. Good to be able to gather and to praise the Lord together. Uh, just a few announcements I want to bring to your attention at this stage, just to say that next Sunday will be a, a family service, a back to school with God family service. So that's uh, 12 noon as normal. Now that we're back to our 12 noon time. Then there's a prayer meeting this Wednesday at 8.30 in the hall. Uh, and you're, of course, encouraged to come to that. I'll also mention Youth Fellowship. It restarts a fortnight's time. Uh, 17th uh, for all young people, year 8 and up. And the first week will be in the Assistant Hall at 7.30. Then also just to mention, I'm planning to run communion classes uh, from the end of September into October. Um, so there's an opportunity to think through what it means for the Christian to take communion and to become a full member of the church for those of, it's for those of all ages and suitable for those who wish to transfer membership from other churches or, or denominations as well. So for more information uh, or to register, please do speak to me. And then just a couple of other things I want to mention. Uh, I think one of them might have been in the announcements last week. One of them wasn't, but I'll put it, I'll print an announcement sheet for next week. The first one is just to mention there's Foundations, which is the Presbyterian Church's training for youth and children's leaders. There's a couple of dates upcoming at the start of October. Uh, and if you're involved in any of the children's or youth work, I very much encourage you to go to this. So the first one's in the maze on Tuesday the 3rd of October, or the following week on the Thursday the 12th in the Moy. Um, and you can register on the PCI website. Then the last one is just to mention that you may well have heard in the news two or three months ago that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland had announced changes to um, the law and curriculum regarding relationships and sex education in post-primary schools in Northern Ireland. Now there's going to be a response evening to help uh, Christians think about this in a positive and helpful way. And that will be in St Anne's Church in Dungannon on Thursday, 28th of September at 8 p.m. It's being hosted by the Evangelical Alliance to help parents, teachers, other school staff and governors to respond um, to that in a positive and helpful way. Um, and there's more information on the Evangelical Alliance website. But as I say, I will put that in an announcement sheet for next week so you have all the details. Or you can ask me if you want it forwarded before then. Um, I think that's all the announcements I need to mention for now. But as we begin, I want to read just one verse from Psalm 122. David said this, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We'll stand and sing together a hymn based on that psalm. I rejoice to hear them say, come and worship God today.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those words we've been able to sing. Come and worship God today. We thank you for the awesome and wonderful privilege you give us that we can come and worship you. That we can come together as a, as a family of your people to sing your praise, to delight in you, to worship you, to bow before you. And we pray that as we do that this, morning, this afternoon, that you would come and meet with us by your spirit. That you would come and bless us in this time. That we would know that sense of your presence, your leading. That you would come and open our hearts to what you would be saying to us, open our ears. Father, we thank you that you are the great God, the great King of all gods. That you are the maker of heaven and earth. That you are the Lord of all. And as we bow before you, we thank you that you are the God who is holy and just and good. That you're a God who is good all the time. We praise you that you were a God of mercy. And we thank you for how you showed that mercy in your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for that mercy which was shown in his death on the cross. How he died for our sins. That we could be forgiven. That we could come to you as our God. Father, we thank you for this time that we have Sunday by Sunday where we can come in the name of Jesus. We recognize how easily we take our minds off the gospel, take our minds off Jesus in the course of a week. How easily we go through our days living uh, without paying you a second thought. And for that, we ask for forgiveness. And pray, Lord, that you would renew us and refresh us in this time together. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would come um, now and uh, that, that through him you would come and bless us. And change us, that you would transform us. That as we turn to this final of the I Am sayings of Jesus, where he says, I am the true vine. And the call within that passage to remain in Jesus. We pray that by your Spirit's help, we would remain and draw nearer to Jesus today. That we would fix our eyes on Christ our Saviour. The one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. The one who is the way, the truth and the life. The one through whom we can come to you. And we come now in his name. Amen. <clears throat> now, with the being communion, I don't have a, a, a normal children's talk this morning, but I just want to think, help us think about something for a few minutes here. And this is just a couple of parables um, about forgiveness. Now, we looked at them at the Holiday Bible Club in Castle Caulfield. We looked at Joseph here at the start of the summer. It seems like a long time ago now. But um, back a couple of weeks ago in Castle Caulfield, we looked at a few parables of Jesus. Uh, and two of them were, one was the unforgiving servant, and one was the parable of the prodigal son. And there's both stories where we see forgiveness in them. Now, the unforgiving servant starts with forgiveness. The, the, the servant begs the king to forgive him, and the, and the king does. The servant says, I'm sorry, I will pay back the money as soon as I can. And the king forgives him. But then the, uh, the servant has somebody else come to him and ask for forgiveness. And of course he's raging and has him thrown in prison and doesn't forgive him. So that's one story where the servant asks the king to forgive him. He says, I'm sorry. And he says, I forgive you. Then the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, he's got the money from the father. And he runs away to the foreign country, he wastes all his money. Uh, and spends it all and then thinks, oh, I'm such a fool, what I'm going to do? You know, he wanted to eat the, the food that the pigs ate. He thought, what am I going to do? I'm going back to my father and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. Say, I'm sorry. And of course, before he's even able to say sorry, the father sees him and runs out and puts his arms around him as a sign of his forgiveness. 
So we see there the prodigal son in his mind was going to say sorry. Now he didn't even get the opportunity because before he could, the father had forgiven him. But what, what we see in both those stories is people saying, I'm sorry, and somebody else saying, I forgive you. And when we come to communion, we remember that because that remember that when we say sorry to God, he says, I forgive you. That because of uh, Jesus' body and blood given for us, he forgives us. That Jesus died that we could be forgiven. He died for our sins. It tells us in 1 John uh, 1 verse 9, that when we, when we confess our sins, that God's faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when we confess, when we say sorry for the wrong things we've done, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. And so we come to communion thankful that God offers us that forgiveness because of what Jesus has done for us. And we remember that Sunday by Sunday, not just in communion Sundays, but this morning in particular, we remember that God offers us forgiveness for all our sins when we say sorry to him. So let's pray. <coughs> Dear God, we thank you that you are a merciful God, that you're a God who offers us forgiveness because Jesus died for our sins, because Jesus, your son, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're sorry for how we've sinned against you. We're sorry for those ways in which we have sinned in the things we've said and the things we've done and the things we've thought. We are sorry, Lord. We confess those sins, but we are thankful. We are thankful that you forgive us, that you offer us forgiveness through Jesus. And because you are faithful and just and good, you forgive us, forgive, forgive us. And also you continue your work of purifying us to make us more like Jesus. So we pray that by your spirit today, we would know that uh, assurance of forgiveness and also that ongoing work of cleansing, that more and more we would be like Jesus, your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to stand and sing together Jesus Loves Me
going to read together from God's Word. And with two readings this morning. So as I've said, we're looking today at Jesus saying, I am the true vine. Uh, and we're going to read firstly from Isaiah 5. Because as, as we'll see, in the Old Testament, <coughs> Israel was spoken of as a vine or a vineyard. Uh, so we're going to read a bit about that. And then we'll turn to John 15 and uh, the passage, I am the true vine. So first of all, Isaiah 5. And you can find it on page 689. <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower on it, or in it, and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Amen. Then to John 15. We read verses 1 to 8, and it's on page 1083. And here we see Jesus speaking to his disciples. And we read these words. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. So that it will, it will be even more fruitful. You're, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let's pray. In our passage, we have read the words, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Lord, we pray that you would come and Take your word now by your, through your spirit and bring it home to our hearts that it would remain in us, that it would change us, that we would hear you speaking to us today. Lord, give us understanding, give us insight. Come, on by, your, come by your spirit and give us ears to hear what you would be saying to each one of us and to us as a church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Where are you today? Well, you can answer, I'm in Pew, whatever number, in English Presbyterian Church. I'm in Northern Ireland. Or you might answer with regards to age, I'm in my teens, or I'm in my 20s, or 40s, or 50s, or whatever. Or you might say, I'm in... We could 
answer it with regards to health. I'm in good health. I'm in good shape. Or maybe I'm, I'm not in such good health at the moment. Or maybe with regards to mental health, I'm in a good place. I'm in a good place at the moment. Or maybe I, I'm not in a good place. We can answer all kinds of ways and things that we are in. But for the Christian, before all and above all must be the answer, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. The phrase or the word Christian is very rarely used in Scripture. Only a handful of times and a few of those times it's used as an insult or in a demeaning way. Whereas much more common is the phrase in Christ. We see, it Paul, we see Paul use it many times in his letters. But also we see today and in other places that Jesus uses it as well. To be in Christ. This is part of, or last week we started looking at what was called the farewell discourse. And that runs from chapter 13 through 17 in John's gospel, which is a, a set of teaching that Jesus gave the disciples in the upper room coming up to the Passover. We read it last week, chapter 14, where we saw Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as part of that passage, he says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now this week, we're a chapter on from that. It's still the farewell discourse. But as part of that same passage, or same section, we see Jesus speaking about not only that it's the Father in him, we're in Christ. And I suppose our theme for today is that just as the, fa- just as the Son remains in the Father, we must remain in the Son. Just as the Son remains in the Father... We must remain in the Son. But what does that mean or look like? We have no better explanation or illustration of it than this passage of the vine and the branches, where Jesus says, I am the true vine. And eight times in these eight verses, which we've read in John's Gospel there, we've read the word remain, what it means to remain. And we're going to think about that as well, and what the implications of that are for us. And to to do that, we're just going to walk our way through the passage, breaking it down and thinking about what exactly do those different words or, or parts mean? And what does it say to us? Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, we need to remember and keep in mind here the context into which Jesus was speaking. As I've said, he was speaking to the disciples And um, last week we saw how they were troubled. They were troubled in light of different things Jesus had been saying. And Jesus was seeking to bring them to a place of trust. But we can keep in mind the things Jesus had said that had made them troubled in the first place. He'd spoken of of how he was going to leave them. He'd spoken about how he was going to be betrayed. And also he'd spoken about how Peter would deny him. So all these things were fresh in their minds. All these things were troubling them. And it's in that context that he said last week, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now I say last week, it's just a matter of minutes or maybe an hour, I don't know. Um, The same evening, or same day anyway, he said these words, I am the true vine. Now for us, we can kind of picture that. We can picture it on the screen, if, it, if not anywhere else. We know what grapes look like. We can see them on the branch there. And we know that they're connected to the vine. We, we get this. But the people in Bible times got it even more. Because vineyards, of course, were very common. Were very common and are very common in Israel. And not only, though, were vineyards common but also they would have got the biblical allusions as well. We read from Isaiah chapter 5. We could have read also from Psalm 80 or Jeremiah 80. Jeremiah somewhere else. I've written 80, that's not right. Um, Maybe maybe 20, I think. Um, Different places where, um, where Israel is spoken of as the vine or the vineyard. 
But we need to think here, what a vine is. What's a vine? Well, it's a source of life. It's a source of nutrients, a source of vitality. Uh, and when the branch is connected to the vine, it takes on those, that life, those nutrients, that vitality, and produces grapes, it produces fruit. Now, Israel was supposed to be a source of life. It was supposed to be a source of blessing to those around them. But what do we see in Isaiah 5? That instead, God looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad. And also, later on, God looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So Israel wasn't the vine it was supposed to be. It wasn't the source of life to others that it was supposed to be. And so the, the disciples would have thought of Israel as the vine, but Jesus comes along and says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine that supersedes that vine. I am the true source of life. Now in the I am saying, there's, there's one other place where Jesus says, I'm the true something. Back in the first one, he said, I am the bread of life. But part of that passage, he says, I'm the true bread from heaven. You see, he's spoken about manna that came from heaven in Moses' time, whereas Jesus says, I'm the true bread. I'm the true source of life. That that bread may have provided life for a day till the next bread came, but if you want eternal life, I'm the source of true life, the true spiritual life. And he does the same here as well. That just as Isaiah or Israel was to have been a source of life, Jesus says, I'm the true source of life. I'm the true source of spiritual life, the true giver of life. And we also see that Jesus calls us to remain in him. To remain in him. But what does this mean? Well, it speaks about connection, about being connected to Jesus. And that's an important idea for us to hold on to here. Because when you think about the implications here of the branch being connected to the vine, as the branch is connected to the vine, <coughs> it, it rests in the vine in a sense, it receives from the vine, and it takes on from the vine all that it needs for life and health and growth. It produces fruit because it's connected to the vine. That was ha that's what happens here. Then in verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So we are the branches. And Jesus calls us to remain in him like a branch remains in the vine. That we are to be connected to Jesus just as the branch is connected to the vine. So as branches, we're to be connected to Jesus, to remain in him and receive from him all we need for spiritual life and health and growth. That if we're to produce spiritual fruit, it's by remaining in Jesus. The, 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 the branch only produces fruit as it's connected to the vine. You chop off the branch, no fruit comes. And for us, we must be connected to Jesus, remaining in Jesus, if we are to be fruitful in living for Jesus. But what does that mean or look like in practical terms? How do we remain in Jesus? Well, firstly, we need to have come to Jesus in the first place, to have been born again in him and received life from him. But then we remain in him by humbly depending upon him. That branch can do nothing on its own. That branch can do nothing apart from the vine. It won't produce fruit on its own. And we can do nothing to remain in Jesus unless we're connected to him. We can do nothing for him unless we're connected to him. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. But how do we remain in him? How do we Receive that spiritual life he holds out to us. Take hold of that spiritual life he holds out to us. Well, we see a couple of things in verse 7. He says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. So the first thing we see is God's word. God's word must remain in us. We must feed on God's word. Now, in a sense, we can read the word 
without it doing any, any without feeding on it. But as we come in humble dependence on God, He feeds us by His Word. He uses it to help us grow. So we humbly come to God's Word, recognizing our need of it, recognizing our need of God's help as we come to it, and He uses that to help us grow. So we remain in Jesus that way, but also he says, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Now we might think, whatever we wish, what's that? Well, in the context here, it's growing in fruitfulness. It's growing in Christ-likeness. It's growing in Jesus. That we grow as we ask Jesus, Jesus, help me to remain in you, help me to grow in you. And as we humbly come to the Lord that way, he feeds us and helps us remain in him and grow in him and be fruitful for him. It's this humble dependence on Jesus. That branch can do nothing on its own. We can do nothing on our own. It's only as we remain connected to Jesus through his word in prayer and in humble dependence that he feeds us and helps us grow and, f- and brings us the life uh, and continued life in him. But also we see there's implications in this passage if we don't remain in the vine. Verse 2, well, we read the end of verse 1. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it will be more fruitful. There's implications if we don't remain in Jesus. Now, what does this all mean here? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, again, we need to remember the context in which he's speaking. Who all was there? The disciples were there, including Judas. Now, Jesus has said that one of the disciples will betray him, but he hasn't said who it's going to be. But Jesus knows that one of the disciples is going to prove himself not a true disciple. Judas, of course. But Jesus also knows that there are those who maybe look like disciples in our day, but aren't true disciples. They aren't in him. Maybe they're in the church. Maybe they're in some part serving in some way, but they aren't truly in Jesus. They haven't been born again in him. They haven't come and received the new life he offers. And Jesus warns us here of the consequences of that, that he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. And we see it further on, verse 6. If if anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. A picture of judgment here. Jesus is telling us that we must be in him and must remain in him. But also here he speaks of pruning, which is a bit different. The Royal Horticultural Society have said this, the grapevines are vigorous climbers that need regular winter pruning and management through the growing season to produce a good harvest and to keep them within bounds. So grapevines need pruned if they are to be fruitful and remain within bounds. But what does pruning look like for the Christian? If we see the, if we see here that God prunes, what does that look like? Well, we aren't told here, but Hebrews 12 speaks of pruning, of how God uses hardship and difficulties to produce the fruit of righteousness in his people. That he allows us to face trouble or setbacks or disappointments and sorrows. And he uses these things to cut back on fruitful things in our character. To help us grow in trust and to grow in Christ-likeness. That we would bear more fruit in him. But also he tells us here that being fruitful brings joy. Verse 11 I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Being fruitful in Jesus produces joy as well. But what does this say to us as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, as we prepare to come to the table? 
Well, it should prompt a few questions in our minds. The first question is, are you bearing fruit? There's no saying, just as apple trees bear apples or produce apples, and banana trees produce bananas, the Christian produces fruit. It's what the Christian should do. It's the mark of a Christian. You shall know them by their fruits, Jesus said. We should be those who are fruitful in living for Jesus. And so does your life show that you're a disciple of Jesus? If not, as we see here in Jesus' words, it's a major issue. It's something to prompt major questions. Does your life show that you're a disciple of Jesus? The Christian will bear fruit. And if our lives aren't bearing fruit, we need to ask, well, am I truly in Christ? Am I connected through faith to Jesus? And if you are in Jesus, we need to ask, well, am I bearing much fruit? Verse 8 speaks of bearing much fruit. The Shorter Catechism, the first question asks, what is man's chief end? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we can ask, well, how do I glorify God? Well, we see one of the ways here in verse 8. This is to my Father's glory. So in other words, this is how you glorify God, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be a disciple of Jesus. We glorify God by bearing much fruit. But there's good news in this passage. And the good news is that that doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on what we do. It depends on whether we're connected to Jesus and living in Jesus and remaining in Jesus. Jesus is the one who produces the fruit. Jesus is the source of life and health and spiritual growth and vitality and nutrients and whatever other words you want to use like them. Jesus is the source of life. So it's as we remain in him and connected to him that he produces the fruit. All it asks is that we depend on him. Humble dependence. Living in him, connected to him, receiving from him all we need for life and health and growth. Knowing that he has said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for how Jesus said there, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And we long to be those who bear much fruit for you. We long to be those who bring you, all, bring you great glory. We long to be those who give you all the glory. Lord, we know that we can't do this ourselves. That in our own efforts, we will produce nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So Lord, we come now and ask that you would help us by your spirit to remain in Jesus. To remain connected to him. Living in him. That we would receive from him life and health and vitality. That we would grow in Christ-likeness and fruitfulness that we would show ourselves to be disciples of Jesus and that we would win other disciples for Jesus. Lord, come by your spirit, bless your word to us and produce much fruit in us, we pray, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We come together to sing, stand together to sing, there is a redeemer.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is his table. And he invites all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation to sit with him and share in this feast. We read from God's word together in Luke 22 verses 14 to 20. And we read these words. When the hour came, Jesus and his, and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Amen. We're called to examine ourselves as we come to the Lord's table. And to help us do that, I want to just, uh, I suppose, bring a few questions to our minds and then we'll have a time of reflection upon them. So we can ask ourselves, have we any unconfessed sin? And if so, take the opportunity to confess it to the Lord. We don't look so that we exclude ourselves from coming to the table, but rather that we would receive his mercy. Or is there anyone here to whom you have to say sorry? Are there relationships that are broken? And if so, determine in your heart that you'll deal with it and do something about it. Or lastly, we need to ask, are we trusting in Christ alone for our salvation? Not in our membership of the church or in our good works, but simply trusting in his work on the cross. So before I pray, we'll have a moment of quiet reflection. So a time of silence. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you have heard the cries of our hearts. You have heard our confession. And we thank you, Lord, for your promise of forgiveness. And we pray that we would know that assurance of your forgiveness. Father, we thank you for this time where we can gather around the table of your Son, the Lord Jesus. This time where we can gather with all the company of heaven to praise your glorious name. We thank you that you're the God who called all things into being by the power of your word and that you've made us in your image and likeness. We thank you and rejoice in you that you loved this world so much that you sent your son to save us. We remember with gratitude his birth at Bethlehem. We thank you for all he did and taught, the friendships he made, the love he showed and the power he displayed over evil. We thank you that the Lord Jesus became like us in everything but sin. And that by his death and resurrection, he has brought life and immortality to light. We come with thanksgiving. Thankful that by him we've received life. That by him we've access to your presence. That by him we're adopted into your family. And are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus of all the riches 
of your grace. We come to this table not because we are strong, but because we're weak. Not because we're worthy of ourselves, but because of the righteousness of Christ extended to us. We come because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. So send your Holy Spirit, we pray, that in receiving these elements of bread and wine, and be, may be for us the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, our Saviour and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, uh, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. The body of Christ given for you. Yes. Sorry, we'll get the tokens first. Thank you. Thank you. Take, eat, remember, and reflect.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, remember, and rejoice. The peace of God be with you all. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the blessing and the privilege, privilege it has been to be here today. We thank you for the joy we've had of coming to your table. And we thank you, Lord, that we've been able to come purely through Christ and his blood for us shed on the cross. We thank you that Christ went all the way to Calvary, that it was the love of Jesus, your son, that took him there. And we thank you that through Jesus we've been able to come today. Lord, we think of those who've been unable to be with us, some maybe due to ill health, some maybe because they're, they're far from home. Others because they're far from you. And we pray that wherever they are or whatever the situation, that you would bless them. And meet with them where they are. And reveal yourself in all your love and goodness. Father, we pray for ourselves for the week ahead. You know what lies ahead of us. You know uh, what we will face. So we pray your hand upon us. 
And we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, your marks, the marks of your presence, would be seen increasingly in us. That our lives would be distinguished more and more by love, joy, peace, and patience. By kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That our lives would show the fruit of righteousness. That our lives would show ourselves to be disciples of, of Jesus. That we would bear much fruit to your glory. Help us to be those who remain in Christ. That we would be sensitive and, and open to the guidance and prompting of your spirit. Lord, though we leave this table satisfied by your goodness, we pray that within us there would be a hunger, a growing hunger and thirst for righteousness. May we love you more, serve you better, and run with, and run with patience and perseverance the race set before us until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We stand to sing together our closing hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Oops.